Hello, how's it going? So I played Cafe Bosch in Arnhem for two nights in a row. I stayed at a pretty funky hotel. Waking up to those things was pretty funky. Anyway, supporting was Vila Penick. Uh, she does a acid solder club, which is basically a club in the Utrecht uh, where you can solder electronic musical items. So if you live anywhere near Utrecht and you want to get involved building synthesizers and stuff, then check out her website, which is below. Uh, you can go to one of her events and do some soldering. But anyway, she had a really interesting synthesizer with her. Let's have a chat about it. We're currently at Cafe Bosch, uh, just played last night. I'm playing again tonight. It's in Arnhem. And uh, in here is a very interesting synthesizer uh, that Vera is um, taking care of and getting going. So we're gonna have a closer look at that today in this video. So we're gonna pop down to down here. This is where, we're, where the show is actually. But uh, this synthesizer over here, it's the uh, Stime synthesizer. And we need to hear more about what the heck it is and what the heck it does. <laughs> How are you doing? Hey, hello. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yeah, well, we heard this last night. It sounded absolutely amazing. And there's some footage here. And we're going to have a closer look at it now and just see what the heck's what's going on. Yeah, what's so, happening? what is it? Um, so the yeah the Zwarte Dose system is the original name of the system, so black box system in English, and it's from Stein. So it was made at Stein as an educational system mm -hmm. uh, from 19 what was it 1971 to 1975. I think Rob did most of the work for it. So it was designed by Rob van der Poel. Uh, I was also here yesterday, and then other people have started like building uh, upon it further. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's mostly, I think it was used, there was a laboratory at time, and I think it was mostly used like, okay, you want to build something uh, uh, related to the system, then you can grab a circuit, make it in this format and add it to the rest. It was made also mostly to uh, be used with uh, physical instruments. So mm -hmm. strange kind of performative instruments, and this would be the translation of it. But also the core idea was of the of a computer or some sort of computer. Speaking to Rob last night, he, he was mentioning that it wasn't originally intended to be just a music mm. machine. It was supposed to be multi-use, uh, analog yeah. computer for lighting, he said. Yeah, also for lighting. And also for sound. Yeah. So the actual mm. sound creation is, is only, merely a byproduct. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's also the select. We were yesterday talking about the outside DIN switches. Yeah. I think it has something to do with that you can insert some controller. Mm -hmm. So I was talking to somebody the other day and they said like with the select you could switch between the different waveform or you could switch between certain options. The actual machine uh, that you've got that is around is about is four times this. So yep. there's, yep. there's um, yep. multiple different aluminium racks and there's different <laughs> modules inside and you've been slowly trying getting this working yeah. again. Yeah, so, so some of the notes are also still there like the worked or loose cable. This uh. one is working. And they're a little bit upside down. But, uh, yeah. So this is an uh, oscillator, so three of the same type. And uh, the way it's patched now, like, there is some control voltage going in, so each oscillator has a CV input and a function output. And the nice thing with these modules is that you can patch them on the front side, but also through the back, uh, through the matrix. So you could make a parallel patch why, uh, or while some of the connections go through here and then others go here. So three oscillators, and I think in total the whole system had five. Five oscillators. Uh, yeah. And um, it was talking about the knobs because they're yeah. really big. Really like big knobs. Massive, massive knobs. Yeah, you can switch between uh, tone or uh, LFO. Yeah, the big knobs make it also very nice to yeah. uh, play live with. Very playable. Mm -hmm. isn't it? And you can find sweet spots. <laughs> so these are three oscillators. Yep. Then we get over to this one. What's this uh, one? VCA. So it's a dual VCA. Two uh, VCAs, and currently yep. you've got it wired in in a cross-fading setup. Yep. So yeah. So when one is up, the this one is controlling the like the first VCA and then I use an inverter and with the little thing you can see with the, what's, what's it called now? The VU. Yeah, the VU meter. Then it's inverting the signal from the LFO and putting it back so that's why you get this one uh, and then the other. 
So that's uh, that's panning left and right at the yep. minute, isn't it? Yeah. So we got that, and then we have this is a, a modulator, is it? It's yeah, a it's ring like modulator. Yeah, a ring modulator, product modulator, and then this is also one. Oh, that's a ring modulator as well. Yeah, yeah, they look the same. So, so these th these were all built by Rob, were they? Or were uh, these the built blue by somebody else? The, yeah, Rob made the one with blue panels. Yeah. And it's still at his workspace. And then uh, Johan den Biglaar, um, where is it? JDB ah, made those. JDB. But there's also a few with just time on. So I'm guessing yeah. those are made by Johan. These are made by don't know who made it. And it just get, kept on getting added to by different people in Stime no. to, to build up to what it is. And um, yeah, the, the amazing thing about these is they're all in these um, cassettes. And I guess these were off the shelf. They used to be an old sort of yeah. enclosure that you could purchase from shops, right? Yeah, I think what Rob mostly said is the stuff that was there was just what was around in that time. So mm -hmm. they um, didn't go crazy to new places to, to order stuff. It's like, look at a magazine, okay, these knobs look nice, this box is uh, fitting. Yeah. But it's kind of a lot of space left in the back still. So yeah, I'm so thinking yeah. about making the case uh, <coughs> smaller, maybe also from different material. Oh, but it's so nice though, it mm -hmm. already is, isn't it? So, yeah. And the other thing is, so that if on the back, the actual connection that it connects to is a one, two, three, four, five, seven pinned in. So yeah. that has plus and minus 18 volts. Yeah. Ground and I'm assuming some other connections. Yeah, because CV. CV is yeah. all on this thing. To, yeah, to go to here. Yeah, so that connects to yeah. that. Yeah. And, and you were telling us yesterday about the the way that it has, it takes 18 volts into the modules. Uh, they're called cassettes. He yeah. calls them the cassettes, but they actually get regulated down inside the module to plus and minus 15, 15. volts, <laughs> yeah. which is a more standardized voltage for the designs of analog computers and yeah. analog synthesizers of the time, beginning yeah. in 1971. Do you know when about the oscillators might have been made? Mm, I don't know, but maybe you can open one up because Shall some we of them have, have a PCB and yeah. I think it will say it on the PCB. Well, what's uh, it? Yeah, so I did let's open have a look-see, shall we? Yay. Oh, oh, mysterious synthesizers. Okay, it's kind of a pain to get it out of the yeah. box. <coughs> oh, screwdriver time. Yes, this one is Let's on have you. a peek. But I was talking to Sibre the other day and I was like, oh, the back connectors is really to connect to the matrix and the power and the front was meant that you could control from a different sort of interface. Okay, I want this waveform or this waveform. That was the intended idea of yeah. the of the DIN on the front. So that image that you showed us last yesterday, mm -hmm. that had um, um, there was a, some strange interfaces in front of the synthesizer then, which might have been wired into this. But there was also a very interesting circular machine. Yes. What what was that? The matrix. Yeah, the the matrix mixers, really big matrix that uh, Rob also designed back in the day. I don't know how many inputs and outputs it exactly has, but I think it had at least 10 to 15 mm -hmm. inputs and outputs, and it was a pin matrix. And then somehow there was an argument within Stime uh, where the, somebody cut up the matrix in different pieces and threw it in the trash. That's not good, is and it? <laughs> I think That's it a was, shame. Uh, it was a, a, like a place where also Rob said it was nice because there's a lot of builders and a lot of musicians, but there mm -hmm. was also a bit of competition and a bit of uh, like air here and there. But That's yeah. horrid. So, so it was a massive it got version. Cut. What you're seeing in the circle is a yeah. massive version of the pitch pin matrix that you'd see in like a VCS3 and stuff like that. The, uh, the actual oscillators are formant, elector formant mm. uh, oscillators. Well, after doing a bit of digging on this circuit board inside of this oscillator, the rest of them were self-etched. Well, it was a bit confusing because it looked like an elector PCB and I assumed it was an elector formant. Well, after doing some research after the formant, there is another elector DIY synthesizer. It's called the new synthesizer. It was a more up-to-date version of the formant. It was a bit more compact with smaller sockets on the back. And this was in around 1981. There's some of the magazines here right now. And it was based on more up-to-date designs. This specific module also had an extra PCB that was self-designed by the person at Stime. And this took the triangle wave from the PCB and saturated it into a sine wave, which was useful for the oscillator. And that's what we're listening to in the sounds in this video. Yep. So that is the oscillator. Yeah, Five of these in total, right? Yeah, I think three or four are this one. Yeah. But it's kind of a, you don't know if the inside of this one will contain the same. Like I oh. haven't opened it up because I only it's had it for quite some months. Yeah, yeah. And I think the blue ones that Rob made in 71 definitely have a different strip board. <laughs> Ik ben helemaal geïnspireerd door gisteren. Ik ben aan de slag gegaan. En wie waren de schuldigen? Elkootjes bij de ingangsvoltage voltage regulators. 
Die slaan gewoon door. Die kunnen de wisselspanning op die plek niet hebben. Ik heb ze eruit getrokken. Uit de print. De, daar zaten ze. En kijk hier op het scherm. Oh, wacht eens. Je hebt gek beeld bij mij. Maar goed. En dan draai ik eraan. Hoog frequentie, laag frequentie. Het doet het gewoon. Dual CV source. So yeah. it's, a, it's got um, precision 10 turn potentiometers on the front. So you, it's just a precision voltage. And I oh. think this one was also for expressive input, so that you could use some sort of expressive instrument to um, dial that to CV. Right. Oh, oh, there we go, we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, oh, with, bloody, no, bloody. Yeah, it. with the relays. Ah, so it's. And I think it was switchable that the, you could use an external instrument and then. Every time that triggered something, it would let through control voltage or not. So it's a Stein design. So somebody designed the circuit board for this specifically for the pro, pro, for the machine for Stein. So it's a real, it's a merge, and it's probably been built over what, like 10 years, 15 years. Yeah, a years long time. I think so. By various different people in Stein. And it's like a lot of knowledge is lost. So also for me, is like uh, I just got it because somebody got uh, referred to me. Like, hey, we have this old system. We don't know what to do with it. But I got it after I even knew that it existed. And so it's really been a search to find people who know anything about it or all the online data is kind of lost and they took a lot of the documentation mm -hmm. away. So it's all only by word of mouth. This, this one that I'm holding in my hand, yeah. you, we don't know the maker of them. This is a mystery who made this one specifically. Yeah, I think so, because it doesn't say it on the front. And this one is a and comparator, time. comparator. What's that? What's that? What would that say? Oh. Stein products waarschuwing. We gebruiken in a fused use one of the inputs of the seven pole plug. You have to connect it via one series resistance of 10 kilo. Um, um, I see. And I don't know if it's that or if they're referring to if you patch it through the matrix, yeah. all these have like a little, <coughs> little uh, resistor. resistor. So we've got the comparator, we've got plus yeah. and minus 18 volts, and I guess the standard stayed 18 volts for the whole duration of it. Mm. Zero uh, yeah. CV out. So you've got CV out, CV in for everything. So this will connect around the back all the way along wire these cables yeah. to the pin, pin matrix. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, it's all hand wire. Ah, oh, very nice. Uh, it's kind of hard to work like with this kind yeah. of method. <laughs> so I can also go back to like what LFO? <laughs> So you can uh, send, like now LFO is going in, and then you can send the range of how that CV, uh, or the amplitude behaves. So if it goes like all the way like this, or very small movement, and this is going to the ring watch later. And then that one's here. But it's nice to have a visual feedback also about what you're doing, especially if you don't have a system and it's not well documented. Yeah, and then these ones are connected, but there's a portamento. Shame that. They're... came to the first night and I asked him a few questions about the synthesizer. He started the whole project, but as you can tell, the machine still progressed after he left Stein. In fact, somebody else called Simon had experience with this when he was at Stein. And I asked a few questions on the second night at the end of the show. He also is involved at Hack42, which is a hack space in Arnhem as well. And we were lucky enough in the morning after the show to take a look around there. They've got a mini museum at the front. It's got a full of really interesting things. In fact, they let us look in their storage locker and take a couple of things home. And we'll be fixing those up for the museum in due course. Anyway, Simon had some interesting things to add. So let's have a chat. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so you, uh, 
Um, you were part of Stein at one point. You worked at worked at with yeah, a Stein, uh, where these things were built in the 70s and 80s. Yes. And um, basically, this is I think the last incarnation of the boxes because mm. they incorporate all the cables and all the fines they had whilst developing the thing. And it started out with a box like this, just bang, and it was connected to power with the DIN plug. And then you use jacks to connect them together on a table. Yes. And another one to next to it, and then you just patch it like uh, you do with your rack. Okay, yeah. But it was really cumbersome to take it with you, so somebody yes. thought, well, maybe we should something different. And then they saw the VCS3, which had a patch bay with pins. What Rob said yesterday was he started with the VCS3, and I guess he got the ideas to make it from that. So yeah. it matches up. There's yeah, exactly. Okay. And the uh, Steam had a VCS3. It has the same patch bay. So what they did was actually take these boxes, put them next to each other, make a bar here, and all small kinds of cables. Well, this one doesn't have a uh, it that has it over here. And it goes into a bar, and the bar connects to the patch bay. Uh -huh. And then in the patch bay, you can connect all the outputs from this side to the inputs on this side. So output from box one is on A and B. And if I wanted to go to the next box, I take three and four. Yes. So this one is B is connected to three. And in this way, I can connect every box to every box. And you were saying the intention was actually, whilst you were performing, it was designed in such a way that you could take, exactly. unplug it, remove one, and put a new module exactly. in. Exactly, connect it and continue. And the thing is, of course, you have to disconnect the pins connecting to that box, but you could do that. And it was just a swapping way. The side effect was, of course, if you tip this over, they would all fall off. Uh, yes. fall off. So this is, I think, the third incarnation where they made the connections on the back. And it's really smooth, no cables coming out, which is easy as well. And now it works like a standalone box. And now you have a synthesizer we know, like the Formant or any other modular synthesizer. Yes. Well, th thanks for the ad additional information. Yeah, welcome. The next time we're going to yeah. see this, it's going to be uh, uh, looking a lot more together. But cool. it's just cool to get a, get an eye on the Stein synthesizer and where it is at the minute, yeah. and the amazing story that has that it's had for the last fifty years, yeah. and your effort at yeah. you're going to be preserving it. Yeah, for sure. Because I think it's really important that these things they don't also end up in people's studio spaces. That's kind of why I went on this treasure hunt in the Netherlands, and I don't know if a lot of people are doing it at the moment, but. Uh, I see some people that uh, sell and buy these things, but they end up in very closed environments. Yes. And I kind of want to eventually see, okay, how much of these things can come together and it's an open space where people can play around with yeah. it. So I also want to visit the museums. Like, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's ideal. It's important for yeah. people just to come and turn on Exposure. <laughs> explore, explore things. But yeah, that's the yeah. Stein synthesizer. Anyway, that's it for this video and the Stein synthesizer. If you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe. And remember, don't be scared to try it.